Welcome back, Grace Kids. We're so happy to have you here. Today we are going to be reading Pig the Pug. Pig was a pug, and I'm sorry to say he was greedy and selfish in most every way. He lived in a flat with a sausage dog, Trevor. But when was he nice to him? I'll tell you, never. You've got some great toys there, poor Trevor would say. But Pig would just grumble, they're mine, go away. But it might be more fun, said Trevor to Pig, if we both played together. Well, Pig flipped his wig. No, they're mine, do you hear? Only mine. You keep your paws off them, you sausage-shaped swine. I know what your game is. You want me to share. But I'll never do that. I won't, and I swear. And with that, he proceeded to gather his stuff and made a big pile with a huff and a puff. And once he had gathered them up in a pile, he howled from the top with a satisfied smile. There, shouted Pig, now you won't get my loot. It's mine, 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 mine. So why don't you scoot? But just at that moment, poor Trevor did see the pile was wobbling. Oh dear me. Watch out up there, good Trevor did cry, but the shame of it was, well, pigs cannot fly. These days, it's different, I'm happy to say. It's so very different in most every way. Yes, Pig shares his toys now, and Trevor's his friend, and they both play together. Well, pigs on the mend. And that was our story of Pig the Pug today. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you again next week. Well, welcome to uh, another Wednesday and with co and coffee with Colin. Um, we're just doing a little update in the middle of the week here for Grace Community Church. Anybody else who might want to join with us? I want to thank Haley for uh, reading that special little story for the kids. I hope your parents managed to get your kids out. And a uh, good thing about YouTube is you can just play it again if you need to. <clears throat> you know, I find it very difficult to speak to a glass eye, which is what we've been trying to do for the last couple of weeks as the COVID virus has, has basically shut everything down and forced us to go uh, online. And uh, I want to say to some of you who are maybe enjoying sitting in your easy chair and with your own cup of coffee or tea and uh, just checking in that this is only second best. And I hope that uh, you're looking forward to the day when uh, we can get back together again and spend time fellowshipping together time around God's Word and just seeing each other personally. And so anyway, I don't want to get used to this and say, hey, I can do church this way. Let's just keep on going like that because uh, God wants us to get together and encourage each other. It's a two-way street. <clears throat> I do want to appreciate, I just want to say I appreciate the response of some who have, who have emailed and just said, hey, thanks for uh, just connecting and putting a face to grace. And uh, I did, I haven't, everything hasn't been positive. I did get one negative comment, at least, and that was the fact that we called it coffee with Colin, but I never took a sip of my coffee. So for the naysayers out there who are critical of uh, what we've been doing here, this is, to, this is for you. All right, now that you got that out of the way, um, I hope you're doing well. Um, I know that some of you are uh, probably still working which is uh, hopefully a good thing. I hope you're safe. I know some of you are in self-isolation because of certain I issues, and I know that uh, maybe it's not a bad thing sometimes to get a little bit of time alone, but I know some who are in self-isolation find it a little bit wearisome after a while and just would love to get out. So we're glad you've joined us. I know there are also some in our congregation who have been laid off uh, through this time, and I know that that's not an easy thing. And and uh, I just want to let you know that we're thinking about you. I'm going to be praying for you this morning. 
and uh, pray that God would just give you peace because He's sovereign over all things. I just wanted to also make a point that uh, if you have some genuine needs that you need help with, would you please, please call me or one of the men on the board or somebody else who you know, and uh, we can put some feet to some of those needs. There are people who have already offered to help uh, run errands for people who can't get out. So please avail avail yourself of that if you need it, okay? We're here to serve one another. Um, I just got a few thoughts I want to share with you um, this morning from God's Word, but uh, let me just pray for us before we do that. I know some of you would appreciate that. Father, we'll bow in your presence this morning, and I thank you that uh, you're alive and well. And I thank you, Father, that you are sovereign over not only uh, heaven, but you are sovereign over all things in this earth, and you are sovereign over our lives. And we thank you that we can trust you. Even though we can't see you, we can trust you. And Father, you've proven yourself faithful so many times. Father, I want to pray this morning especially for those who are maybe a little lonely, sitting by themselves, and uh, I pray that you would just go and visit them and encourage their hearts. I pray they'd reach out to somebody else and get in contact and find fellowship that way as well. Father, I want to pray for those who uh, are worried and I'm sure there are some who are, who are worried about getting the virus or about what's happening in their lives right now. There are some, Lord, who have lost their jobs. There are some who are financially um, worried. Father, would you just, uh, by your grace, bring the peace of Christ to their hearts? Would you assure them, Father, that you have not forgotten them, that you never will, and that you will take care of them however you see best? Father, I want to pray for those who are sick. We know we have some who are chronically ill, and they struggle with things day to day. And I pray, Father, for your mercy for them. I pray that they would know your sweet presence and the assurance that you're in charge. I pray, Lord, for those who might have uh, the virus. Father, I don't know of any in our church, but Lord, others locally here and around the world, I pray, Father, for your mercy. We realize how fragile we are and how absolutely dependent we are on your mercy and So, Father, we just ask you to be gracious that somehow, Lord, this would abate or that somehow they'd find a cure. I pray, Father, in the whole process of things that you would uh, encourage those who are on the front lines working so hard, Lord, to try to protect people's lives. I pray for your grace for them, for your protection for them, for your strength for them, as many of them are probably very weary, and I pray you'll keep them from the sickness as as well. Father, I... uh, I want to thank you for uh, your word. I pray that you would just encourage us, even with it this morning, just with a few thoughts. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You know, I was thinking about, um, about the irrationality of the Christian life or of the Christian faith. And you go, well, I'm not sure I like the way this is going. To have the pastor of the church talking about how Christianity is just not rational. And it's not. But I just want to share with three three reasons why I think it's so irrational. And uh, stick with me. Don't run away until you've heard me speak, heard the whole thing. But I think the Christian life really is. It really does make no sense. In fact, the Bible says that many people call it foolishness. And there are three things that I just came up with. There's probably more that are irrational. But the first thing I thought about as I was thinking about this was that uh, it is totally irrational in my thinking that a holy God would die for willful sinners. And every one of us is a willful sinner. Even if we decide we're going to be perfect, and some have tried. It doesn't last for long. We are innately sinful, but we are also willfully sinful. And when you think about how selfish we are sometimes, how committed we are to taking care of me first, how willing we are sometimes even to hurt other people, how deceptive we sometimes are, and all of that is 
really an affront to the character of God who is perfect and wanted to make a creation who was like himself. And he got us. And so often we fail so miserably. And when we stop to think that a holy God who doesn't need us at all would send his only son because we had failed. And in order to repair that failure, his only son, God himself, would have to come and die a horrible death, a painful death, shed his own blood to cover the sins that he never did. He went to a cross and died for the very people who put him there. That is completely irrational. Absolutely irrational. In fact, it is also irrational that he would die for Colin Peters. That's the first thing that I think is so irrational. Sin is an absolute disobedience to God. You know what? <clears throat> Even as human beings, we have our own understanding that some things are just fair. And we make our own rules. And when those rules are broken, we enforce justice in every segment of society. You know what happens when a little child defies their parent? We call it discipline. We put, send them to their room. We take away privileges. We do something to bring upon pain onto that child to help them understand that they did something wrong. There were rules in the house. They broke them. When they go to first grade, they find themselves staying in at recess. Little innocent kids. Why? Because they were told not to talk, and they defied the teacher and decided they would do it anyway. A teenager gets his license, and he gets a new car. And one of the things he had to do to get his license was to write some tests, proving that he understood the laws. And he gets in that new car and is having so much fun, he doesn't realize that all of a sudden there are flashing lights behind him. And he feels badly. But the officer comes up and says, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to write you a ticket, and that'll cost you $120. And we understand there are consequences for that. You know what happens? If I pay my telephone bill late, they still charge me extra money. It's a penalty for doing something wrong. Every area of our culture has penalties for wrongdoing. We are sinners. We deserve eternal death. So it is irrational beyond any understanding that the holy God of the universe would step down into our world and go to a cross and die for our sins. Well, there's a second thing that's irrational to me, and that is this, that heaven is free forever. Heaven is free forever. All expenses. You know, sometimes people get really excited because they entered a contest or they did something and they won a prize. All expenses paid for a trip somewhere. And it usually includes airfare, it will include maybe hotel accommodations, it will include meals, maybe some spending money, and maybe some special event. And it usually lasts three, four days, maybe a week, and then they return you home, and all their obligations are over, whoever was putting on the event. I thought about that. And the Bible says that in Ephesians chapter 2, it says this, verse 4, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trusses, passes, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. And he raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You may be familiar with that passage. It goes on to say, For by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. You know the passage. But you know what verse 7 says right in between there? It says this. <clears throat> he raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places 
in Christ Jesus. And then he's got these two words, so that. It's a purpose statement. It explains God's motive in doing something. Do you know why he seated us with Jesus in heavenly places? So that in the ages to come, ages refers to forever, eternity, ages that keep going on and on and on. In the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. You see, God doesn't plan to just bring us to heaven, let us roam around. God has a plan, and He seated us positionally in Christ so that one day when we die, we actually go to be with Christ so that forever and ever and ever and ever and ever He can continue pouring out the riches of His kindness on us. I imagine something like this, that God has, has a kind of a tickle trunk beside Him. That maybe sounds a little trite. But I just imagine that God has a special trunk beside him, and, and I show up one day, he said, Colin, listen, I got something for you. And he opens up his trunk, and he pulls this experience or this thing out or, or this something that absolutely gives me absolute pleasure. And then the next day, I happen to be by again. He goes, Colin, come here, I got something for you. And he opens up his trunk, and all day long, I get to enjoy that. Next day, the same thing. And for the next week, the next month, the next year, the next century, the next millennium, on and on and on for all of eternity, God has placed me in Christ so that He can just keep pouring out the riches of His kindness towards me. That does not make sense. That is completely irrational. It makes no sense in our thinking to, as a human being. So first of all, a holy God dies for our sins. Secondly, <clears throat> He gives us heaven for free forever and all the blessings that come with it. You know what the third strange thing is that really is irrational? You see, understand that I am needy. Maybe even in this coronavirus, you have special needs. And we understand that we have needs and we're, we're told that we can go before the throne of grace and talk to God and ask for Him for help. That makes sense to me. Not that he should want to do anything for me, but that I would need to approach him. And that's true. I'm welcomed into his throne room with any request I have. But you know what? Sometimes we're not doing so well. And sometimes, in fact, we're feeling so broken that we can't even pray. You know what happens when that happens? Romans 8 Romans 8 tells us this. It tells us that <clears throat> the whole creation we live in, our whole world is groaning. There's always trouble. And Paul says, and we groan too within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body, waiting for Christ to come back and get us. But he also talks about that groaning we go through. And then you know what he says? He says, there's somebody else who groans, and it's not me. It's God Himself. It says in verse 26, Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses, for we don't know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings, with feelings so deep, that it can't even be uttered. That's irrational to me. I understand that I should pray to God because He's greater. But for God to come and pray for me doesn't make sense at all. I don't know what you're going through right now, but I want to tell you three things. Number one, a holy God died for you. He really did because He loves you that much. God so loved the world that He sent His only Son to die on a cross that whoever would believe in Him would never perish, but enjoy eternal life. God loved you so much that He died for you. 
The second thing is this. If you know Jesus as your personal Savior, you're headed for heaven, and it's free. It is all paid for at high cost on your behalf by Jesus Christ. And the third thing is, if you're hurting today, I just want to tell you that God, the Holy Spirit, is praying for you. And I want to encourage you that you would rest in Him and know His sufficiency even in these difficult times. Well, I hope you have a good day. Uh, Have a cup of coffee. It'll brighten it up. God's blessings on you. We'll talk soon.